Good morning. Welcome to Church of the Palms. So glad to have you all here in person. Welcome back from North Carolina. And for those of you who are worshiping online at home, we're delighted to be together on this All Saints Sunday. I'm going to invite you to look through your bulletins and the website regularly to get, pick up all the announcements of the things that are going on at Church of the Palms, both in um, terms of serving and in terms of events. For things like the Salvation Army bell ringing, the sign-ups are going to be online. They're online already. So things like that, just keep checking those two places. If you plan to come help at Rise Against Hunger when we're going to assemble 25,000 meals, today you can register in the lobby with a student. It takes about 10 seconds, just so we know that you're coming. Today is our last gather and row right here in the Campus Center, and we're going to talk about the movie Coco, and there will be popcorn. You may have smelled it as you came in. So 10.15 till about um, 11 or 10.55, love to have you for that. Messiah rehearsals begin tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Even if you have no experience, reach out to Genevieve. That beautiful concert is on December 4th. It's December 3rd, and she says, no experience necessary. So love for you to join for that. And finally, Homecoming Sunday is next Sunday. Right after this service, we're doing a cookout. We're having the Lacey Jane Band, lots of pie, lots of inflatables for the kids. So we hope that you will join for that and know that there is a new member class on that day at noon. So you can take part of the festivities and then you can also um, find out more information about joining this church if you are interested. With that, please stand for our responsive call to worship. Here we are, Lord, your creatures standing before you. This is your day, O God, and we thank you for giving this day to all of us. Be with us in our midst and let us feel your breath upon our face. Let us worship God. Here we go. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. We stream of abundance flow blessed be your name blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place though I walk through the wilderness blessed be your name every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to grace Oh 
Hello, my name is Finn Dingle. I'm in the seventh grade and I go to SSAS, Sarasota School of Arts and Sciences. Our scripture passage from the, for today comes from the 20th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning with the 27th verse. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up the children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married the woman and died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And so, in the same, so all in the same way, the seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection for the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God being the children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham in the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God, not of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all of them are alive. This is the word of the Lord. Children, if you would like to go up to Impact Kids, now is the time that you can make your way back and go have some fun upstairs with Miss Carol and her volunteers. And as they are making their way out, friends, let us pray. Open our hearts and minds, O oh God, to the word just read and the words to come that they might point to you, the word made flesh, Jesus the Christ. It is in his name that we pray, amen. One of the joys of being a pastor is getting to officiate at weddings. I have even picked up some tips on how to be the mother of the bride, which should be helpful as three of our daughters are yet to be married. 
These days, most brides and grooms write their own vows. They come from this basic framework of traditional vows, and they go something like this. I ask the bride, do you take Matt to be your husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, until death do you part? And so far, I don't want to brag, but I'm batting a thousand. All of the grooms and brides have said, I do. You know, the origin of that phrase, till death do us part, is distinctly Christian, dating back to 1549, where it is found in the Book of Common Prayer. I know that it's speaking to the commitment couples are making to love and honor one another all the days of their lives. But it's interesting to me how it speaks into our scripture passage for today and even into our understanding of everlasting life. Our passage opens up with a question from the Sadducees, who were a smaller Jewish sect than the Pharisees. But the Sadducees held all the wealth and the power. They were the religious conservatives who didn't believe in an afterlife, which helps to explain their collusion with the Roman oppressors. YOLO, you only live once, so use, abuse, do whatever it takes to maintain your place in society because this is all there is. You know, the only place, this is the only place in the Gospel of Luke where the Sadducees are mentioned, and they take part in this effort of trying to trap Jesus. After Jesus had cleansed the temple in Luke 19, we read, from that point on, the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people kept looking for a way to kill him. So as Jesus taught in the temple, various groups would try to trap him with questions about his authority, about paying taxes, and now about the resurrection. In Sunday school, Mrs. Hikins taught us a phrase to help us remember the Sadducees and how they differed from the Pharisees. She would say, they didn't believe in the resurrection, so they were sad, you see. It does kind of stick with you, just going to say. <laughs> Knowing this background about the Sadducees helps us to see the motive behind their question. They aren't curious or trying to expand their worldview. There is no spirit of inquiry or desire to learn. Their only goal was to set up Jesus for embarrassment or to discredit his teaching since any attempt to answer that question at face value would reveal the absolute ridiculousness of belief in an embodied resurrection. And it all has to do with marriage and death and remarriage till death do us part. Marriage in the Bible is not based on any kind of notion that we have of marriage today, where one can marry her soulmate and best friend. Even this sometimes happens after she's dated several guys. How else would she be able to weed out the prince from the frogs? It reminds me of the connection that John and Anne Klein made over 47 years ago when they were married, a choice they made a little later in life. Anne has battled Alzheimer's for 19 years and finally had to be placed in a nursing home in 2019. In keeping his vow, till death do us part, John visited her every single day, that is, until the lockdown of COVID. He was panicked because he didn't want her to forget him. It was very important for him to be with her every day singing songs that they loved so they could keep their connection strong and so she would remember him. With the help of the facility administrator, John came up with a novel idea to get around the social distancing guidelines. He stood outside at the window of his wife's room and through the screen, they sang songs together. Let's sing Jesus Loves Me, John would say to Anne, who was sitting in a wheelchair across the room. Anne had a slight smile of recognition as her husband sang to her. They are both in their 80s, and during COVID, this loyal and devoted spouse never missed a day at the window. 
marriages in first century Palestine were more along the lines of young girls being given to men to procreate. The young women were property to be owned, not individuals to be in partnership with or to be in love with. The specific scenario the Sadducees raised involved leveret marriage, described in the book of Deuteronomy, in which the brother of a deceased man is to marry his brother's widow in order to produce a child who will perpetuate his brother's name. This mosaic law also provided a bit of security for the widow who had no safety net for survival in that culture outside of her husband or a son. The Sadducees wanted to make resurrection look foolish by showing the impracticality of what do what to do with people who had been married more than one time. Rather than walking away or taking the bait and attacking back, Jesus challenged their premise that marriage as we now know it would have anything to do with life in the kingdom of God as we would later experience it. Essentially, Jesus said, whoever told you that marriage would be part of the life in a post-resurrection existence. Can you imagine the relief of women who are part of a physically, emotionally, or sexually abusive marriage? Welcome to heaven, where you get to be married to that creep for all of eternity. Fortunately, it's not like that. This passage does make me wonder about the resurrection. We say in the, in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body, but it doesn't tell us what that resurrection looks like or what that resurrection life will be like. Is Jesus saying we won't know our spouse, friends, and family members that we love? I learned that this scripture passage in Luke and the equivalent passages in Matthew and Mark are the only discussion of resurrection in the Gospels. So honestly, we don't really know. Even though this passage doesn't paint a vivid picture, it does insist that resurrection life is qualitatively different from life as we know it. The ordinary events and relationships by which we track our journey through this mortal life, like marriage, childbirth, graduations and retirements do not characterize our eternal lives because resurrection life is not merely an extension but something entirely different. Jesus does not say that we will not know those who have been dear to us, only that resurrection life will not be marked by the same features as this one. Indeed, given his statement from the scripture passage about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it seems that the relationships defining our current life may persist, certainly with God and likely with each other. So even though death may part us for a season, I have this inkling that we will be known and loved by our people who have loved us well and by our God. Which brings me to that important five-letter word, trust. Can we trust the very character of God who has been creating and breathing new life into dead places for all of history? Can we lean into the mystery and trust in the goodness of a God who loves us, a God who puts people in our lives to enliven, to heal, and to encourage us along our journey. Some of those people are with us now, and some we can only remember as they have become one of the saints in heaven. And because today is All Saints Sunday, we are going to have the opportunity to remember Saints aren't a special category of larger-than-life people who happen to be the opposite of sinners. In our tradition, saints are just regular salt-of-the-earth people, sinners like you and like me, who happen to be forgiven, who happen to be in the loving arms of our living God. 
Do you remember that lovely quote by Flavia Whedon? Some people come into our lives and quickly go. Some people stay for a while and move our souls to dance. They awaken us to a new understanding with the passing whisper of their wisdom. Some people make the sky more beautiful to gaze upon. They stay in our lives for a while, leave footprints on our hearts, and we are never, ever the same. So we have a day set aside each year to remember the saints who have left footprints on our hearts. We have a day set aside each year to honor our dead, to honor our grief, and to celebrate their memories and how they have helped to shape us who we are and who we are still becoming. In her book, The Cup of Life, Joyce Rupp wrote, memory can bless or haunt us depending on what stirs inside our mind and how we receive and live with it. Be the gatekeeper of these memories Catch the ones that draw forth and enhance your core goodness. Savor them. Let these blessed memories fill you with hope. I'd like to ask Justin to come out so he's ready to play a song that he will be singing as we light candles to remember our loved ones. For this time, I want to invite each of you to think of a cherished memory of someone who has passed away but has also passed through your life in a positive way. If a harsh memory happens to come first, acknowledge its presence and release it. There may be an opportunity for healing in that memory, but perhaps now is not that moment. Because today, today is a day to cherish the lives that have led us to a greater sense of well-being the lives that have brought more spaciousness, more generosity, patience, courage, humility, wisdom, compassion, peace, clarity, or contentment in your life. When that person, that memory, enters into your awareness, please come forward to light a candle. Friends, embrace savor and embody the memory of your beloveds. The candle you light shines for your loved one and continues to shine through you. Only scars in belong to me and you love me no such thing as broken and all the old we made new in the thought that makes me smile now even as the tears fall down the only scars in hell are the hands that hold you now. And though the road you walked was anything but easy, you picked up your share of scars along the way. And now you're standing in the sun. Thought your fighter, your race is run, but pain is all a million miles away. The only scars in heaven won't belong to me and you. There will be no such thing as broken. All the old be made new The thought that makes me smile now Even as the tears fall down The only scars in hell 
are the hand that holds you now. Hallelujah. 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 Well, the hands that hold me now. It's a lot of days by. See you. you live on and on and that a part of me till I'm standing with you in the sun. I fight this fight and this race I'll run until I finally see what you can see the only scars in heaven. Won't belong to me and you. There will be no such thing as broken. And all the old will be made new. The thought that makes me smile now. Even as the tears fall down. The only scars in heaven are my hands that hold you now. The only scars in heaven that won't belong to me and you. There will be no such thing as broken. All the old will be made new. The thought that makes me smile now. Even as the tears fall down. The only scars in heaven. All my hands that hold you now. Great. Okay, here we go. Living God of all creation and goodness, as children of the resurrection, we give you thanks for the people you have placed in our lives to shine your light for us and through us. On this All Saints Sunday, we are reminded how fleeting and fragile life can be. May we use our time on earth to love one another well to encourage and empower those younger than us, to be open and curious with those who are older than us. And when the day comes and we lose yet another to death whom we loved so much, may the hope of the resurrection give us peace and comfort until that great day when we get to join the God of creation who is restoring all that is broken and making all things new, when the only scars in heaven are on the hands that hold us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. It is fitting that today on All Saints Sunday, it is also Legacy Sunday. We take the opportunity to give thanks for all of those people who have remembered Church of the Palms in their estate planning. And it's also a time that we get to invite others to join the Legacy Society. Most of our legacy giving is directed to our foundation here at Church of the Palms. Dave West is the president of the foundation and has also served in various other ministries in mission trips and, he, and other places and is here to tell us about the important work of the foundation, all that it does for Church of the Palms. So please welcome Dave. Thank you for turning the lights on for those of us who are starting to lose a lot more sight and hair and a few other things along the way. Uh, good morning. Um, 
Boy, I don't know. I, I, do I need that? Okay. Um, so today, thank you, Lori, I wanted to talk briefly about the foundation uh, for the Church of the Palms and to ask you to prayerfully consider whether giving to the foundation is a way in which you would like to leave a legacy for future generations. The foundation is a legal entity which is separate and distinct from the church. So uh, today I want to talk about the purpose of the foundation, how we manage the assets of the foundation, and then finally how the assets are used. So uh, briefly, the purpose of the foundation is to receive and administer gifts and donations and to use them for certain mission projects, capital improvement and facility projects, and other activities supported by the church. Most important to note, none of the assets of the foundation are to be used for the operating expenses of the church. So annual giving is designed to pay the salaries, keep the lights on, and run the day-to-day -day programs of the church. The foundation exists for longer-term capital projects, mission, and other community projects. So how do we manage the assets of the foundation and spend your money? Uh, first, the foundation has received many special gifts from both individuals and from people's bequests from their estates. As Laurie said, the Legacy Society is an active group of people who have made provisions for Church of the Palms in their estates. Right now, the foundation currently has over $7 million in assets, and that sounds like a lot because it is. However, the foundation is designed to exist into perpetuity. So in any given year, we can only spend a small, small part of the assets, or 4%. The rest of the balance, we diligently invest in ways that earn profit so that the foundation is designed to never run out of its assets. If you are comfortable that you would like to give to the church in ways that are above and beyond your critical annual offerings, I would encourage you to think about a foundation legacy for the works of the church in the future. Some are most comfortable leaving those types of gift in their wills, and that's most typical. However, you can also give to the foundation now while you're alive and have the opportunity to see those dollars working. Your gift, when combined with the gifts of others and the existing balance of the foundation, can enable you to make a much bigger impact than you can simply by acting alone. And so, as an example, how big an impact can you make? Well, this year we have at our disposal in the foundation nearly $300,000 for the non-operating assets of the church. Our biggest single gift of the year was just approved. We will be granting well over $100,000 to help churches in Northport, Port Charlotte, and other locations recently ravaged by Hurricane Ian. Our funds will help them rebuild, recover, and most importantly, restore their congregations. In the past, the foundation has supported the purchase of property for expansion, and then guaranteed the loan for the Christian education building and sanctuary, the establishment of our food pantry and other feeding programs, Habitat for Humanity, the television ministry, Honduras Eye Clinic, the seed money for Samaritan counseling, and much, much, much more. If you have any questions about supporting the church beyond your normal annual giving, please come see the folks from the Legacy Society today. They'll be out under the table with more, under the tree with a table with more information, or please contact myself or any of us on the foundation board. You can make a difference today and into the future, and I hope we can do so together. Thank you for your time today. Wonderful. I would like to invite our mic runners up at this time. We are at the time in our service where we get to celebrate first all of the joys, all of the many blessings that God um, has just been doing and working in our lives. And we also get to lift up those things that are heavy on our heart, those things that we would appreciate prayer for, that we would like to be in community over as we work through within ourselves and our families and the affected areas as we just lift up different things this morning. Uh, before we jump in, though, I'd love our mic runners to introduce ourselves themselves. Uh, hello, my name is Devin DeJesus, and I am a sophomore at Booker High School. Wonderful. I'm Ava, and I am a senior at Venice High School. Thank you. And I would love to get our responses on the screen as well. Uh, do we have any joys or concerns that we would like to lift up this morning? Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of course. We pray for them this morning. Lord, hear our prayer. Are there others? I don't know if any of you have heard this, but uh, coming up on Tuesday, uh, we have midterm elections. This isn't a political thing at all. Uh, But I I would ask that we would pray for wisdom for people, for safety for people, and just for the the entire soul of our country, Mm -hmm. that uh, God would be at work within us and through us um, in our republic. Mm-hmm. Yes, we lift up that election and just the ways that God continues to move in our country. Lord, hear our prayer. Um, I, I have just more recently been um, uh, struck and saddened uh, Again, maybe a second wave of sadness or so, just about the time of COVID in our country and the, just the sadness, the loss, the, you know, things will not ever be the same and just lamenting that. Um, and it's just been heavy on my heart lately. Yeah, for all those who just continue to be affected by COVID in different ways and family members and experiencing this illness still, Lord, hear our prayer. Well, as we pray together this morning, I would like you to pull out your bulletin. And on page four, if you would join me in our litany for All Saints Sunday, this will be our prayer for this morning as we pray together. Do we have slides for that? Will that be on the screen? No? Okay. Does anyone need a bulletin? You, if you raise your hand, we might be able to have somebody run. We have somebody in the back here who could use a bulletin. You know, I'll tell you what, mic runners, we can squeeze in. I'll share. We remember the great ancestors of our faith from Abraham and Sarah to Paul and Phoebe. We remember the prophets and priests, the ministers and teachers who taught us the way of God. Teachers of the faith, we remember. And we remember our grandparents and parents, aunts and uncles, those who have gone before us in our lifetime. We lift up the memories of children and grandchildren, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives and parents whose lives ended too soon. We live up to you, O God, the names of those we have lost in this past year from our lives, knowing that they are with your heart forever. We celebrate the lives of those we have remembered, O God, and lift up many more names in our hearts. We give thanks, O God, for all who have gone on to join with you beyond this life. We trust in the hope of resurrection and the promise of new life in Christ and know that in our grief and celebration, O God, you are with us through it all and we are not left alone. In the name of Christ, in whom love lives forever, we pray. Our living God invites you to this table to share in the feast of grace, forgiveness, and love, a love that goes on forever and ever, a love that was given through Jesus, who on the night that he was betrayed took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. 
he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat and remember me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, the cup that was poured out for all, for the forgiveness of sin. Jesus said, Whenever you drink of this, remember me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And friends, he will come again. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, make us one as we partake of these your gifts to us, so we might be in communion with you and one another. As we break bread together, may our eyes be open to see your glory shining through all the saints of times past. As we lift the cup of salvation, may we be strengthened to follow your way, even to the point of death, mingling our praises with the blood of martyrs who offer themselves for God's new day of justice, peace, and harmony in Christ Jesus our Lord. As we prepare to receive this sacred meal, we silently confess our sin to you, O God, and we ask for your forgiveness. We give you thanks, gracious God, for your love and forgiveness that restores us and empowers us to begin again. Help us to live as your children each and every day until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at God's great family reunion with all the saints. Keep your church one in service to the world here and now. Work with who we are and where we are to form these clay pots into vessels of living praise, that our lives may participate in the same unending song of the universe raised by all the saints, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor and praise are yours, almighty God, now and forever. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite the communion servers to come up. Jeannie will have bread on this side. Kay will have the cup next to her. Sam has gluten-free bread right in the middle. And Megan has the cup on this other side. And as we are set up here, we'd love to invite the AV crew to come on down first so they can get back to serving. The gifts are ready, the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. Grace, my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear? Now I first believe. My chains are gone. I've been set free. God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His 
mercy reign, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. It's worth my hope secure.
took wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. My 
hope and my prayer is that the memories and the actual encounters that God has for us this week will continue to grow and shape us into who God really wants us to be. And wherever we go, please receive this blessing. May the beauty of God be reflected in your eyes, the love of God reflected in your hands, the wisdom of God reflected in your words, and the knowledge of God flow through your hearts so that all might see and believe. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.